Hello and welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm a senior editor with the Mises Institute. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And Tho and I are here today to talk a little bit about uh, the state borders of the United States. Can they be changed? Um, did Jesus draw them? Are they perfectly drawn as is? Could these lines change? Um, and why so much resistance to changing them? It's, it's really quite odd. I wrote an article this week on how, uh, or actually late last week, on how the state borders were obsolete in the United States for a variety of reasons, and received a surprising amount of hate mail about it. People apparently were taught somewhere along the line that the current shape of the U.S. states is somehow sacrosanct and must never be changed. And that's uh, it's a strange attitude, completely irrational, but I guess it's just something people were taught to emotionally embrace at some point. Um, and we'll talk about some of the, the problems with that. Uh, proceeding today, and we'll get into some related issues just about how, um, for example, how the states in the United States are huge um, and how their their form of representation in Washington is completely different uh, as compared to perhaps some arguably better run systems that are very similar, such as Switzerland. So, so uh, how you doing? Um, <laughs> how are things in uh, in Florida? Would things be improved by changing the the state borders there? But what have you heard, like from others, in terms of all the stuff like Oregon, the Greater uh, Idaho thing, where we're going to change the border between Idaho and Oregon uh, to better represent the people from rural Oregon? We, we've got something going on in southern Illinois. We've got uh, counties in California that want to break off and get some better representation. Uh, is is this something that, that has larger buzz outside just those particular regions, or does it have yet to enter really the national conversation? Well, I do think you're seeing on the edges, particularly when you have very different polarizing political dynamics, again, like, like uh, East and West, you know, Washington um, State and things like that. Florida is actually a very interesting situation. Because historically, Florida is a very diverse state, not only in terms of, you know, Hispanic, Cuban, you know, Miami versus, you know, my, my, my fellow uh, Southerners up here in the panhandle. Um, but politically, obviously, you have a lot of, of first generation Floridians that move here, which come create their own sort of political dynamics. You know, Central Florida has a very Midwestern um, sort of, of, of culture to it because of transplants and things like that. And this has led to some very big pockets of different political divides within the state. It's actually homogenizing a lot more right now. If you look at you know, the, the last presidential or governor's election, you just had very few sort of isolated pockets of Democratic strongholds, usually associated with universities, uh, Gainesville and um, you know Orlando area and, and some, some places like that. Tallahassee is still you know still a blue area, um, but Florida is a very interesting example of a very populous, very diverse state becoming more politically uh, homo uh, uh, more politically alike whereas you do see a lot more divides particularly when you think of you know areas like Georgia where you have a historically very conservative state have a growing island of, of blue within the Atlanta metro area and so I think with this kind of general national concerns particularly among kind of the Republican right there there's a very and for a variety of reasons, right? It's not simply purely demographic concerns. Some of them have to deal with changes to election laws um, and, and things like that. But you know, there's this growing sort of trepidation about the degree to which the current political order has almost created a national one-party state. And so therefore, I think one of the, 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 the conversations that is kind of slowly burning really is this conversation about, you know, should states change their change their borders you know should we have a greater idaho should california carve up some areas um and, and i think when you when you've seen conversations about how to change the senate when you see conversations about you know, you know when, when, you, when packing the supreme court is on the table you have a complete erosion of political norms and once you have that you know have those conversations happening all sorts of things are are you know getting out that, that used to be outside of the index card of allowable opinion we we'll have to pay Tom Woods for that, um, they, they now become possible outcomes. I think this is one of the more interesting ones out there. Right. And uh, it's, of course, not a new issue either, this idea of changing uh, the makeup, right? If you can, you can look on Wikipedia, dozens and dozens 
of attempts to uh, change state borders and consolidate some states, split some, break off from one state, join a, a piece of another state, that sort of stuff. All that stuff's been going on for a long time. It hasn't happened much since the 19th century is the issue, because obviously it was a very live issue when the United States was adding territory. Uh, and so you had to uh, decide, hey, the U.S. stole all this land from Mexico. How shall we draw the lines between the U.S. states on this new territory? And that, of course, then meant uh, you had to really figure out how that was going to be done and and which territories would be basically you know, smashed into some other territory. So you got places like Western Colorado, which is on the other side of the Continental Divide from the state capital. And even today takes four hours to get from Denver to the main city in Western Colorado. Uh, that's assuming ideal weather. So <laughs> this this isn't very practical, certainly in the year 1900 or 1860 or anything like that. But that's what they did. They just drew some lines on a map, very straight lines in many cases. Uh, and even back east, there's a lot of just straight lines that they just randomly drew through places. Uh, and we're not necessarily drawn according to settlement patterns. Now, part of the reason that worked for so long is there just weren't any people in a lot of those places. So you could draw these sizable states around uh, one or two or three major towns and cities, and all that frontier land was just a bunch of farmers uh, who weren't especially numerous. Uh, and over time, though, that changed. And especially then in some places out west, thanks to water uh, being being moved around, irrigation issues, urbanization, the demographic reality started to really change over time. So then what you ended up with were situations where you had, like San Bernardino County right now, which is a huge county, larger than Rhode Island, uh, and wants to break off and maybe do its own state, in which case it wouldn't even be anywhere near the smallest state. Uh, it would be, I don't know, I think the 11th largest state or something like that. Uh, it wouldn't even be particularly small um, to be its own state. I mean, why should it be included in California except for just status quo bias? This is the way we've done things and we can't change things now. And so you make these suggestions. And to anyone who's an outsider, you'd be like, well, of course, this this region with two million people should have its own representatives. But Americans uh, seem to be just really wedded to to the way things are done. But there's no particular reason for that, uh, except to just cling to worry that something might change and and then that might be bad. But unless you think the status quo is just going well like gangbusters, I don't think I don't understand why you should think uh, the way we're doing things uh, should be done that way forever. And so other pending examples then, as I mentioned, are taking some of these rural areas of Oregon and welding them onto Idaho and then taking Southern Illinois, which is also tends to be, I wouldn't say rural, uh, but certainly separate in its demographics uh, from Northern Illinois. And they could join other states. I mean, it wouldn't even be a big issue at all. You're not talking about any geopolitical issues. This wouldn't change how the U.S. behaves internationally, wouldn't change anything about the military. Um, but there are huge obstacles to be able to do this legally because, uh, dumbly, it's accepted that the Constitution prevents states from redrawing their own lines amongst themselves without approval from Congress. So if if Oregon and Idaho want to change their boundaries in a way that only really affects them, except with maybe some minor effects on some federal land and federal water, uh, but not even a major change, uh, they have to go through Congress. So then you've got hundreds of people who've never even been to Oregon or Idaho voting on this issue and deciding what Oregon and Idaho get to do in terms of their border. So that's where we're at. Everything has to go through Congress. And so that's why you hear people saying, well, that's just never going to happen. Well, of course, never is a an eternity in politics. Of course, it's, the the realities are going to change at some point. The question is, can you do it in a uh, a gradual and rationalistic way, or just at the end when uh, when the central government's power breaks down, which of course will happen someday. Just not sure when. And so, never isn't isn't correct. Uh, but uh, the, why not talk about it now and start to look at more rational ways to divide up these state boundaries?
Right. And it's, it's even playing off. I mean, you know, r- right now you have interesting side conversations about you know, the statehood of Puerto Rico, the statehood of Washington, D.C., um, which then invites conversations like, OK, well, should Washington, D.C. be a standalone state? Should it be absorbed into a Maryland or Virginia? Um, you know, th- these things are already kind of happening. You know, you know, w- once you start breaking the, the that, that, that really nice round number of 50, I, I think it, it really invites on the table. And of, and of course, historically, you know, the entire process of statehood in the United States has always been within the, the shroud of partisan politics. <laughs> right? I mean, it, it, you, know, you, you have dynamics between free states versus slave states. You have you know, backroom conversations you know, in those Capitol Hill halls um, because there's a recognition that states have with it a, a – it's, it's not simply about the well-being of the residents of that political you know, unit – there are national consequences to creating new state power. Um, and again, when you have, I think, so much frustration on, on, on to a certain extent, both sides uh, about the current status quo, then I, I think it, it, it creates opportunities for these conversation to have, you know, outright. Again, this is what's driving, again, you know, the, the reason why Democrats are explicitly talking about statehood in Puerto Rico, it's not because of perceived slights that Puerto Rico has. Um, you know, they, they, they use that language Use the language of, oh, you know, poor, exploited Puerto Rico. They don't get a say in things, yada, yada, yada. There's actually many, many benefits they enjoy from not being a state. Um, but it's because they assume, okay, well, that's going to be, you know, two senators for the Democratic Party that they can count on. It's going to be an extra member of Congress. This is going to help us dealing with national issues and consolidate our power and then be able to use that power to ram our ideas down the throat of the rest of the country, right? This is the way that they're already thinking, and so conservatives in the right or those who do disagree with those opinions need to be thinking the same amount of – with the same prospects here. And, and particularly what, what I, I think you – know, when, when I visualize you know, what – how you can kind of re, reevaluate the lines of the Congre- – of, of the United States, you know, it's always interesting to look at congressional representation because then you can kind of really see you know, the, the, just the islands of blue surrounded by red – Within the majority of the country, you know, you, you obviously have the, you have the coasts that that have you know a lot of blue on the, on each side. But for the most part, in most of this country is is very very red, and you know I think the the congressional representation offers a very unique sort of way of looking at okay, well, how could you actually form political unions that would have a lot more homogeneity in terms of the views and values, and you know how how far could that go in terms of creating more representative government. And again, you know, I, I think along the lines of the angst at the national level, the increase, you know, and this has been our, our favorite talking point for, for years now, the increased appreciation for the degree to which state politics can radically change the landscape of your community. Um, you know, perhaps those are two forces that could lead to better evaluation of these issues. Uh, but one, one of my articles, Ryan, that I've always, always enjoyed for yours, and I, I think real life examples are always very helpful in talking about relatively extreme ideas, is, is thinking about the way that federalism has played out in other parts of the world, and particularly the Swiss model, um, which is you know, a, a topic that we love to talk about the Mises Institute all the time. Um, but, but the way that the Swiss model highlights, you know, if, if, we, if we think about what a Swiss style of government would look in the United States, I think people would be shocked. At, at you know what that functioning structure w- would mean if applied to kind of the the American country. Oh yeah, well the title of that article where we looked at it, we found that if American federalism were like Swiss federalism, there would be thirteen hundred states. Uh, and the the issue there is that American states are just huge, and people don't appreciate how small. Um, the 26 Swiss cantons are, which in their federal system are, is the equivalent of, of an American state. In fact, they, their 1848 constitution is modeled on the U.S. constitution um, because they had such deep religious divides and so on. They wanted some way to provide uh, a way for all these different groups to function together in some sort of federal union, uh, which they to this day call the Swiss Confederation, um, without leading to civil war. And uh, this actually came... At the end of uh, of a small civil war that occurred mid-century, where I think like 300 people died, so 
Uh, the Swiss are also much better at civil war than the Americans. Um, they don't kill 2% of their population to do it. But uh, their Swiss cantons, even today, the population of the largest one is Zurich, which has 1.5 million people. So that would make it one of the smallest states in America. And uh, in fact, smaller than all but 11 states. And most cantons have much less population than that. Uh, in fact, the median population is 234,000 people. So uh, if northeastern Colorado were to split off from Colorado, which uh, was something that they've been talking about since 2013, uh, they w- <laughs> that region of the state, which is mostly farmers, nevertheless, it does have a metro area in it, would still have slightly more people than the smallest Swiss canton. So this idea that those places are much too small to have any sort of self-government and so on, well, tell me how badly the Swiss system works. I mean, it works fine, right? Also, the Swiss system, we might note, has uh, non-democratic representation in their federal government in the sense of that each canton gets the same number of representatives. So if that were in America, we'd hear all the time about how undemocratic that is and everything should be portionally, proportionally represented, blah, blah. Uh, but that's the Swiss do it. I don't hear a whole lot about how undemocratic Switzerland is. Uh, so that just kind of shows you how parochial the American debate is around that. And so the whole scale of the U- the United States is, is much, much too large because you can imagine uh, how much less diversity there is in a Swiss canton that has 100,000 people, well, that has about uh, 300,000 people, uh, or a million people. It's just a completely different situation than some big, sprawling state uh, like Illinois or California, where uh, people are just very different from region to region, uh, from ethnic group to ethnic group, and they have none of those controls that Switzerland has, or which the United States is supposed to have overall, which is in terms of there's not territorial representation, there's not the second house is, is represented the same way as the first house in their legislature, so there's no means of providing people who live outside the urban core uh, some sort of disproportionately large representation, which is what prevents uh, resentment and conflict over control of the of the state, because you need some way, and that's what the Senate was designed for, that's what uh, the non-democratic representation in Switzerland is for, is for people who are outside those most populous areas to have a voice of some kind. And none of the states have that. The states all have just kind of these general majority rule governments. And so that's one reason that you really see uh, the uh, the resentment in, say, eastern Oregon or in southeast California or in southern Illinois. It's this issue of we have basically no voice because we just have nothing at the state legislature that can even get any respect or representation outside these big cities. So um, that's that's con- continuing to be a problem. And it wasn't always a problem to the same extent. People forget that prior to 1964, many states did have state senates that were represented territorially. So some states, for, Alabama was one example, where each county had a, um, uh, was guaranteed a certain number of, of represent or senators, state senators. And then you had other states where the, regionally you had state senators that were guaranteed to that region. So you could have some regions that were very rural, very sparsely populated, and they had, say, uh, a thousand people. But then you would have a senator from another part of the state that had 300,000 people. Now, that's obviously not democratic in the sense that there's a big mismatch in terms of how many people are represented by one senator, but it does provide a break on the ability of the populous areas to just do whatever they want and run roughshod over the less populous areas. And that's why you see so much uh, pushback from what are mostly tend to be lesser populated areas outside the more urban core. It's these people who are in the smaller cities or in outright rural, uh, uh, rural areas that because of the way they now do proportional representation, they just don't matter anymore. But prior to 1964, they did things different because they appreciated that you needed to somehow balance things out or else you had whole parts of the state that just wanted to get out. So they offer no solution to that. They just want to keep doing the things that they've always been doing since 1964. We just don't care 
about those less populated areas. Tough luck. And so, of course, those places want to break off and get some sort of different, better representation. And there's another element to why I think this is a very attractive strategy from a, a, a cynical political perspective is that, you know, when we often think about ways of restructuring the government, often it requires sort of a sense of nobility, right? It's like, oh, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to take away power from ourselves. You know, we're, we're going to rein ourselves in, um, you know, it, it, we're, we're going to elect in good, good people that you know, understand how dangerous and bad government is. And therefore, they're going to be able to act on the greater selves and yada, yada, yada. The reason why I think this is such an interesting political approach and something that that that, that I, I I expect to gain traction over time is that it creates more crowns, <laughs> right? It, it allows it allows for smaller fish to become bigger fish by the ability to redraw lines, right? And and I think that that self-serving sort of aspect, while it's something that we often do not like to talk about, I think is important for seriously considering how do you, how do you reform a system without collapse? And then I think there's an, there's an additional level uh, lever here where, you know, when you, when you have the ability for public referendums to break away, I think that has, you know, we, we've seen it play out with, with Brexit with, you know, results there. I, I think people, you know, it's, it's been a little disappointing, I think, but Brexit was an example of a popular po popular referendum used to break away a tie from a larger political entity. Um, you know, in, in recent years, you know, populist democratic leaders um, have been sort of uniquely positioned to, you know, stick it to, you know, whatever the, the larger, uh, uh, you know, ideological persuasion of the elite, the global, the global elite, whatever you want to, you know, however you want to see it out there, right? Being able to, to consolidate with a sort of a popular approach to, you know, resetting political lines. I think, I think it's a line, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, we, we are, we're living in such an era of you know, uh, democracy and civil liberties that are very hostile, I think, in their nature to liberalism and the Misesian tradition, right? You know, these, these are all affronts to property, right? So the, the, these are things that we do, we, we are inherently distrustful of because they allow for various forms of positive rights that create tyranny upon others. But given that we live in an age of democracy and civil rights, we have to figure out a way of challenging the status quo from a perspective that will appeal to normies raised in this era of democracy and civil rights. And so therefore, I think popular referendums to break away from a state capital to empower the voice of their populations by improving their standing on the federal level, to create representation for a minority group, however you want to define that, um, to, to have their voice heard, well, there is going to be that pushback from this broader partisan conversation that permeates everything. I think that is ultimately the strongest footing out there that has had success against prevailing political winds. And that's why I think this is something it, we, there's, there's growing discussion out there about secession, right? And a very good book, Breaking Away, Case for Smaller Polities by, by Ryan McMakin at the at the Mises bookstore. Um, there's been, you know, th that conversation has come up, national divorce has come up within mainstream conservative circles. Um, I, th I think in the short term, there are very real practical issues there. Um, Daniel McCarthy, I think, has some very interesting insights on that. I, I think this is a, is a natural middle ground that needs to be taken more seriously. And I, I think that's, that's and again, the, 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 the examples of Switzerland, you know, I think that the left has, has had a the Bernie Sanders crowd has benefited a great deal, um, particularly in the conversations of healthcare, right, by often misrepresenting but pointing to real life examples of how those very sophisticated Europeans do things. And why can't, you know, why, why can't us Yanks have it as good as the, you know, the Swedes do in their medical system? Um, I, I think, you know, pointing to, well, hey, those Swiss are doing all right. You know, perhaps we should take something out of their book. Um, I, I think that also helps in trying to, how, how do you get someone who is not going to, you know, read Nations by Consent to Mary Rothbard, get on board by Nations by Consent. And I think this is a way of getting to that, that middle ground. Well, hey, if you want a country that uh, functions like Switzerland, you got to start with a country that's about the size of Switzerland and it has about the diversity of Switzerland. So let's break off a state of the U.S. that has about 10 million people, make it a sovereign state, 
It uh, can be mostly uh, centered around one or two cities in one part of the country. And then, sure, let them experiment with some sort of localized welfare state. That's great. Fine. I, if, if Bernie wants that sort of thing, then he should help me break off pieces of the United States to look like European countries that have seven, eight, nine, ten million million people. That's the, those are the countries he points to most, right? Those northern Scandinavian countries, the largest of which is Sweden, with 10 million people. Well, otherwise, we're looking at Norway with 5 million or Finland with 5 million. Oh, those countries, they function so well. Well, they're also the size of Colorado or Minnesota. So maybe that has something to do with it. Maybe having a giant 330 million people uh, in, in a huge, diverse country doesn't really work for the welfare state the way it works in a, in a country with 5 million uh, basically uniform people. Just throwing that out there, and uh, maybe Bernie uh, should be willing to, to strike a deal on that issue. But I, I completely agree, right? There's no place for principles in political deal making, right? The principles come from outside. So we're, of course, the Mises Institute, we deal in principles all the time because you need principles in order to restrain the state because the state's only restrained from the outside. This, fundamentally, and Mises pointed this out, it's not about words on some parchment document. When states are restrained, state organizations are restrained, it's by public opinion. It's by what people are willing to let them get away with. So that comes from principles, but that's all on the outside. When it comes to the inside, these people, right, they care about power. That's all they care about. And you got to be able to work with that. They, these are not good people. St. Augustine pointed out that the equivalent of a political ruler is a pirate, that there's really no moral difference. And so, OK, let's look at how state representation should work. The, the Republicans should straight up just say, like, they sh this should just be their standing phrase, no vote on Puerto Rican statehood until you let us get a state like Southern Illinois be its own state or Eastern Oregon gets its own state, that, that sort of thing. So sure, you can get senators for Puerto Rico, but we're going to get our own senators also and balance the system out. Uh, and so any talk of Puerto Rico should just be straight up rejected out of that. And why is Puerto Rico the only the only part of America that needs better representation in Congress? Clearly, that is not the case. So it's those sorts of deals, right? There's no real principle there other than give me mine for me giving you what's yours. That's just the way it's always worked, as you note, right, in the 19th century. Lincoln promised to give the West Virginians their own state if they would bust off and turn against uh, Virginia. There was no principle at work there. And lo and behold, the uh, Supreme Court just signed off on whatever the regime thought was best. So that was declared constitutional, even though uh, constitutionally in the text, you can't just create a new state without the old state's consent. So whatever, that, <laughs> it's just about deal making. And so, yeah, that's that needs to be really at the forefront of this sort of thing is what sort of uh, who's being represented here? Who's getting something? And so it seems that the left is always playing hardball on this and the right is always talking about principles and such, uh, which gets them nothing. But, but guess, guess and, what, right? Kevin McCarthy is going to read the Constitution on the floor of the House. So <laughs> liberal. Shit yeah, that's very boots. cute. Yeah. That's like those people who send constitutions to their Congress members thinking, well, this will change his mind if, if he just reads the Constitution. That thing goes straight in the garbage or it gives it to some constituent. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, at, at it's point, time to be a little bit more savvy about that stuff. My, my favorite thing is at one point, like, during, like, this was like, like I think, like, like proto, like, trust the plan. That I remember back in the Tea Party days, like, there was, there was people that would make a big deal about, like, the, the, the fringes on the flag. Like, oh, if, if the flag has, like, the, the golden frill, it's, it's, an, it's an admiral flag, and therefore the, the laws don't apply or something like that. And just like, like no. I know what you're like, talking about. <laughs> like, no, like, they, they're, they're not going to allow the you – know, it's the proper flag in the room uh, curtail the tyranny. Uh, <laughs> what they've already made in a backroom deal with some lobbyist and uh, – you know, the, 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 the approval of the New York Times. I mean, it's just... The, yeah, the it, courts that said it was okay to lock up American citizens in camp, so long as they were of Japanese descent, is going to set me free because there was a fringed flag in the courtroom. I mean, give me a break. Well, but we'll yeah, some people function status, on that level. They'll, they'll, love, they'll leave it alone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the courts are there to help the regime get what it wants by crafting uh, sneaky legal arguments that look like there's some sort of principle involved, but they're generally 
uh, is not. I mean, yes, yeah, sometimes it breaks through and, and people have their ideas of what's right and wrong. But if you're looking for people in Washington to uh, if you're if that's what you're counting on in Washington, well, you're going to be disappointed a whole lot. And we think about like and, and there's, there's also some, some interesting grounds out there. Um, you know, if, if you think about like uh, uh, you know, the, the, the east, southeast uh, uh, California. Right. And like, you know, here, here you have an, an area of, of an extremely blue state. And, and of course, the, the representation of California is like an absolute atrocity. I mean, I, I know you mentioned this in your article, but I, uh, I believe it's what, uh, like 300,000 people per uh, 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 310,000 people per state representative on whatever the, 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 the data that you had. Um, this article, which was written in you know, 2017, um, work backwards from there. Um, which, which again, like, if you, historically, right? Like that's, 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 that was far more than the founders ever wanted for like congressional representation, much less state legislative representation. So you have people, you know, in Palm Springs, that is a, a historically Republican era area that are victimized by a blue gov- blue state government that they have no hope of changing, right? The, 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 the statewide elections are which Democrat ends up, you know, competing against the other Democrat in a jungle primary, um, you know, their quality of representation is far better than your average Puerto Rican without statehood because of the degrees to which they have representatives within their own, you know, local government, right? And so, again, those are the sort of areas where you have people that have absolutely no hope at all. I mean, you, you want to talk about politically vanquished people. You know, there is no one more vanquished than those individuals that have no hope at even state. Because like, occasionally, right, you, you'll, you'll have a state like Illinois – or, or a, uh, a, a Massachusetts, right? That elects some sort of, you know, Rockefeller moderate Republican governor, and 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 you'll have, you know, some quirky overrepresentation at the state level, um, because you know you, you have a you have a percentage of people that that you know are very liberal in terms of national politics, but they still don't like their taxes raised, um, and so you'll have sort of interesting little, the, the state state politics will be a little bit different. Than, than their national representation, you have no hope of, of anything changing in a state like California. Um, and so therefore, there is no hope besides looking at these sort of dynamics here. And given the just the absolute decay of, you know, the, the quality of life in that state, unless you're very, very rich or, you know, have nothing to lose, um, that's the sort of dynamic there that can, that can make things interesting, I think, in the, in the next, uh, you know, in, in the, the short to medium-ish term. Yeah, well, I mean, that's just another uh, example of how these states, as currently drawn, are just much, much too large in many cases. Because in order to have what they, what the state government considers to be a reasonable size for its legislature, requires that people have almost no representation with their state legislator. So that Congress, back in 1790, the, the, uh, the average Congressional representative represented 37,000 people. And that was Congress. And in the state legislature, it was even less. And even into the 19th century. So when Colorado became a state, it had like tens of thousands of people who lived in the state. <laughs> um, maybe 200,000 total for the entire place. And so you were looking at, and that had 100 legislators. So you're looking at thousands of people, a few thousand people per legislator. Whereas... California now, you're looking at 310,000, as you noted. And that's way ahead of every other state. In Texas, it's 138,000. Texas is pretty bad, too. It's the largest states that tend to be bad. So tell me, how are you represented as one of 100,000 people by one person? Uh, the, the, uh, the people who wrote the Constitution would have thought that was absurd to, to even suggest that that is political representation at those sorts of huge numbers. And it uh, the agreement in the in the 18th and 19th century is that it should be around tens of thousands. So 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people is the correct size for a legislative district. But now we're looking at stuff that's magnitudes of 10 sometimes above that. So that just doesn't make any sense and call your legislator and expect them to like be to act like they're your neighbor or that you have a lot in common. It's just that's just not the reality. And it's, of course, way, way worse uh, in the House of Representatives, the U.S. House of Representatives, where it's about 500,000, 600,000, I believe, the last time I checked, uh, per district. Uh, 
which that just means you're nothing. You, you have no influence over these people on an individual level. And it certainly wasn't that way as originally designed. But you got people so wedded to the status quo that they'll say, well, if you if you just let members of Congress represent only 50,000 people, you would have to have thousands of members of Congress. And we cannot do that. So therefore, since apparently the size of Congress is the most important principle in the universe, the only then we just have to make the congressional districts bigger and bigger forever until the sun burns out, because to change that would just be crazy and radical. Uh, whereas all your, all those people are really telling me is that the United States is much too large and you can't have a functioning legislature that represents on a reasonable level that liberals, class, classical liberals would have considered reasonable in the 19th century. So maybe you need to split the U S up into some sort of different representation scheme rather than just double down on congressional representation that has been in place since the 1920s. So it's now been a hundred years since they increased the size of Congress. Uh, but before that, they increased the size all the time for good reason. But now suddenly we don't need that anymore. And now everything's just so great in Congress. So why change anything? But that's the attitude a lot of people have. Absolutely. Shout out to Mark Thornton, um, who's done some very interesting uh, research with some co-authors on the way that constituency size, um, the, 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 the fewer uh, voters per represent, representative tends to lead to outcomes that are you know more physically responsible, more aligned with the good governance and things like that. So again, I'm always glad to, to give uh, Dr. Thornton a, a shout out with some of his, his great work, o overlooked work. I, th I think that's one of the more interesting, this is a very interesting topic in its own right. And of course, it's this, you know, no one benefits more from this dynamic than that, that, that parasitic, unelected political class that is the bane of so much of our existence at all levels of government, where you, know, you, you really have no, you know, the, the, these are people that are basically allowed to work within the shadows um, for their own agendas. Um, this, this is what leads to, you know, the, the, the managerial revolution of sorts. This is what leads to that, that managerial class that is able to, to put very alien uh, ideological concepts into practice, you know, in, into the power systems. And, you know, that dynamic, again, it's, it's, it's as, as pervasive at the state level as it is the federal level, if you have, again, you know, such a, a lack of, of democratic check. And because it, it, it's only the threat of people losing something that creates any sort of leverage against an elected official. This is also, you know, becomes a, a back end way of, of being against term limits, neither here nor there. It's a, it's a discussion for another time. Um, but but that is it. it uh, you know, it, there, there is some very interesting political science research out there that validates these conclusions beyond our own you know, individual bias in favor to, you know, towards the, the approach of political decentralization. Well, and back to the Bernie thing, too. If Bernie wants a system like Sweden, he needs to find a legislature that's like Sweden. And in Sweden, they have uh, one uh, legislator per 28,000 people. That's about equal to uh, Utah, Utah state legislature. Um, so again, very, very small scale, completely different. It's this 28,000 versus 600,000, uh, for your national legislature in terms of the people it represents. Uh, so, uh, but yet the, the left, which idolizes these places, uh, refuses to look at the actual political institutions that are in place there. They just want, they just want that as a, do a talking point for how great socialism is, even though these countries aren't even socialists, they just have big welfare states. Uh, so uh, again, something's like deeply broken and, but you just can't get people to, to move away from it. The, the, the way states are made up now, the representatives they have, it's all just, it's all just magnificent and you can't change anything. You just need to put the right people in government and all of our problems will be solved. And so just taking any sort of radical suggestion that looks for a big departure from the status quo and say, that'll never happen. That's crazy. Just stop, stop even talking about it. Just elect Republicans. Look, nothing's ever going to change, friend. Uh, so you might as well just stop complaining because apparently all your actions suggest to me that you think the status quo is actually fine because you don't want to actually change anything except maybe just tiny chipping away around the margin. So just forget about it. But Ryan, your, your priorities are all screwed up. Imagine if, if we added a, a, a few more states, it would completely throw off the very nice symmetry that we have on the flag. 
<laughs> right? I mean, it's, you know, it just create chaos in terms of the stars on there, and then you, we just can't have that. So, like, yeah, it's it's, we, it's all about the aesthetics, baby. The flag's very, very important, and uh, it's <laughs> the fifty. I don't know. I saw I saw an episode of Star Trek once where. Uh, there was like uh, an antique American flag that had 53 stars or something. I don't know what the other three added states were. So there you go. Even uh, what's his face? Gene Roddenberry thinks that you could add states and it wouldn't be a complete disaster. Uh, although probably looking to sci-fi for ideas, for political ideas, probably isn't a great idea unless you're reading like Heilbronner or something. But <laughs> I probably don't want uh, uh, the political system espoused in Star Trek anytime soon but it is weird that these these are things that people cling to emotionally uh, but but you're right people will actually they like the 50 state idea they think that's important and just any of this other stuff like i i why why was 50 better than 48 i mean why was alaska of course one of the smallest states and i i just have a hard time even just kind of understanding that people care deeply about this that it's a problem redrawing state lines um because again they can't use any arguments about oh the chinese will conquer us if we do it that has nothing to do with any of that um and oh well you can't do that because that would somehow give the other side more senators well then strike a deal so that the total number of senators doesn't change but it would be good for the people in those states to actually get some representation um but there's just there's just no interest in that uh, they just want to keep doing what we've always done well, I feel like this is a good way of ending it because we started off with hate mail for questioning the, the, the nice round number of 50. And we are going to leave this episode with you getting hate mail from Robert Heinlein fans for your bashing of uh, sci-fi. Oh, Heil Broder, that's a political philosopher. <laughs> so there you go. You're... <laughs> yeah, I see. You can tell how much I read of this sci-fi stuff. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't, 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 don't at me, bro. I don't know anything about sci-fi, except that Star Trek has a bunch of commies in it. So, uh, okay. Let's, <laughs> Thanks for listening to Radio Rothbard on this episode. Uh, thank you, Tho, for joining me. Um, and yeah, these are some pretty interesting ideas. And so I would recommend you visit uh, my article on Switzerland on, the, on how it would be 1,300 states. You can find in there links back to more complete analysis about the size of representation. Um, and also links to Mark Thornton's excellent article where he does some great uh, stuff with regressions, looking at correlations and stuff on this connection between the size of legislative districts and government spending and all of that, which Tho mentioned. So that's actually a read I definitely uh, encourage. And so until next time, uh, we're here at Radio Rothbard. Uh, thank you for listening and I hope you have a great week.